Hey guys, welcome back. It's Venom, and I got kind of a two-part video today because uh, I saw something earlier that kind of pissed me off about Starfield. Um, now, for those who don't know, Starfield, huge game from Bethesda, the newest IP in like 25 years, you're saying. Um, yada, 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 you've heard all that stuff before. I saw something earlier that kind of pissed me off, and uh, I kind of got an article up on screen right now. And uh, I'm seeing articles like this kind of popping up all over. So, again, for those who don't know, Starfield releases on September 6th. Um, it's September 1st if you have early access, it costs extra 40 bucks, yada yada. Officially the 6th, but we're going to be playing it on the 1st. And of course, if viewers already have early copies, you know, a lot of places already have early copies, review copies, the embargo is going to lift on the 31st. Now, this game has not even officially released yet, and I'm already seeing articles like this. Now, I have originally wanted to do a potential speculation video on what the DLC for Starfield might look like. And we're going to do that after this little rant here. But I wanted to check out to see if any information for DLC had already come out yet. And there has. Um, apparently they've already announced the DLC. It's My guess is they hadn't even started developing it, but they do have a name for it. Uh, they're calling it Shattered Space. But that's not what I want to talk about right now. I saw this article here from Game Rant. And again, I've seen other articles like this. Claiming that Starfield's DLC might already have been a rough spot. Now... Listening to that title makes it sound like there's some kind of development issue with the DLC, okay? I'm going to read a couple uh, a couple lines in here. I want you to look at this. So, again, this is from Game Rant. Starfield is a few weeks out, but its first DLC expansion, Shattered Space, has already been confirmed and may be in a rough spot already, okay? I'm going to save you guys and give you the TLDR. Literally nothing in this article mentions why it might be an issue, except for the fact that Starfield might be so big, it might overshadow any DLC. That's it. That's what this fucking clickbaity piece of shit article and others like it are saying is that because this has got, you know, it's so big, there might be an issue with the DLC. Let's see if I can find the exact quotes it's saying here. Uh, yada, yada, yada. All the evidence points to Starfield being an absolute juggernaut of RPG and one that players can presumably under hundreds of hours enjoying. I mean, hundreds of hours of content already available from the get-go and makes the concept of a story DLC expansion a bit redundant. Seriously. That is the dumbest... Ugh. Here's another one. With over 30 hours of main story content already and presumably a lot more through side missions and additional story DLC doesn't seem all that exciting, at least not in concept alone. That is the dumbest fucking take I've heard in a while and the dumbest reason for a clickbait. This is... I'm so pissed off looking at this because I was looking at it like, hey, maybe there's some real development shit going on. Maybe I hopped on something. Maybe there's really something crazy going on. No, it's playing game rent going off and thinking that, oh, yeah, because it's going to be so big, any store DLC isn't going to make any sense or people aren't going to want it because there's so much shit in the game already. That is the dumbest fucking shit I've ever heard of, okay? The fucking art. Mm. We're going to go through some of the, some of the, I wanted to go through all the DLCs that have come out for the Elder Scrolls and for, for the Fallout games. Um, and kind of go over what we may expect to see for DLC in Starfield. And I happen to come across that, and I'm like, people are... I get you want to... I get the, there's very little information for the game out that everybody else hasn't already covered. Covered. There's nothing new that's come out right now without any leaks, and I'm not going to go over leaks, okay? Uh, I've kind of made my peace with that. I, I may look them up at some point, but I'm not going to go over them, or at least not cover them here, because they're not supposed to be out. I do understand the embargo and everything. I get why they do it. I'm not necessarily happy that it's it's lifting eight hours before the game comes out. I'd rather it lift a couple, at least a couple of days before the game comes out. But it is what it is. Most people that are going to buy the game have already bought it or pre-ordered it. And those there are very few, I think, that are going to be sitting on the fence waiting for the reviews to come out. But I'm not going to cover those leaks. But there's very little new information right now until the game releases. So I get that people are kind of scraping by whatever they can as far as Starfield content. And I've seen some pretty good creators make some pretty good content with what little that we have. But this kind of clickbaity bullshit is an issue, okay? Now, I'm not a journalist. I would like to be one at some point, or at least, you know, cover games professionally. That is what I would like to do. But this kind of shit here makes everybody look bad. All, may already be in a rough spot. It hadn't even fucking started yet, and this is pure speculation and pure BS based off of what's already in the game. I'm going to go over some of the DLC. We're going to go over the DLCs for, well, I got Fallout 3 and 4. I got New Vegas. I've got Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim. We're going to go over those DLCs and use those to kind of see what may be coming with Starfield DLC or kind of go over a pattern that Bethesda has. Not one of these DLCs, say, for maybe Fallout 4 and some issues with Oblivion, none of these story DLCs, 
I would say were useless in these games. All these games have like hundreds of hours of content in them. And I don't think anyone is going to complain that these story DLCs were an issue or that there was just too much stuff were going on or that they weren't wanted. But yeah, we're going to we're going to go over some of these DLCs, but I just want to go over that first because that was that was a horrendously bad take. And again, I, it's not the only article I've seen, but it was the most prominent and there's people doing this all over, but I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to operate on that. We're going to go through all the DLCs for these six games I just mentioned and kind of go over what the pattern is that I'm seeing and what we may expect for some Starfield DLC. Now, again, they have announced that they've already started working on the first DLC. And as you'll see, there will likely be more than one DLC for Starfield. Again, not including mods. We're talking official support and not out of uh, and not the Creation Club either. We're talking 100 percent, 100 percent created by Bethesda official DLC, not just add ons and uh, for mods or anything. So we're going to start off with uh, Fallout 3, and I was going over this. It's been a while since I played Fallout 3, but uh, first off, we have Operation Anchors. Now, I remember playing this one. This is when you go in the, uh, uh, I think you're with the Outcasts, and you know they, they you go through uh, a simulation, and it's basically the Battle of Anchorage. So it was really cool. Um, in it, you unlock some additional armor and weapons afterward, or afterwards you get it. Um, you're pretty much locked into it, and once you're done with it, you can't go back in. Um, but as the DLCs typically go one of two ways, either you do everything in there one time and once you're done, you can't go back in it or you can go back in and do, do whatever you want whenever. You can go back, it's completely open for you. They do have history of putting about half your DLCs as you go in there once, once you're done with that main story and you leave, you are done. So Operation Anchorage was one of those. Um, and I didn't realize that there were, uh, I don't remember Point Lookout, but let's, we're going to go through. So Operation Anchorage. Uh, again, that was the one where you went through uh, and uh, you did the uh, the hologram uh, in the chair. Uh, the pit, that's where you travel to a whole new area in Pittsburgh. Um, I had a whole storyline about it, but that was a whole new area. I don't remember if that's one where you can go back and explore again or not, but I do remember that opening bridge was insane. That was pretty fun. Uh, Broken Steel. Uh, I think that was the one where you went. This is level cap 30, allowing you to experience more of the game, including your personal achievements. Uh, here we go. Somewhere you fight against the Enclave. So I think that was more of a, almost a straight expansion, uh, from the main story. I don't quite remember anything big from that one. Um, Point Lookout, though, that one I do remember. That one you went to a whole new area. That was crazy. It was essentially damn near a horror DLC, and I loved it. Um, yeah, yeah, here we go. I'll read the thing here. Uh, Point Lookout opens up a massive new area of the wasteland, a dark, murky swampland along the coast of Maryland. So hop on the ferry. I remember that ferry and what they did to you. That was a good DLC. I like that. Um, that one and, uh, shit, what was it called again? Uh, from Fallout 4. The damn, um, you're going to make fun of me from, from Far Harbor. There we go. Don't make fun of me. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a long day. That and Far Harbor are a couple of my favorite DLCs from any other Fallout franchise or any of the Fallout games, so... Um, but yeah, like I said, which each of the well, which each of these you typically get. Oh, I'm sorry, Mothership the, uh, Zeta. That's the one where you got to go up in a spaceship and you got a. It, it was basically like a it's a whole separate huge ass dungeon, but you had to go unlock certain areas. You had to rescue people, but it was basically a standalone thing. You got to fight aliens. It was really cool. Um, for those that don't know, Fallout has always been very closely knit with aliens. There's always some kind of alien presence in there. Uh, Fallout Three had it. Fallout Four has it. Uh, even Fallout Seventy Six has it right now. That's the uh, the live service game currently still available. Man, go! I was, I was there's footage of it in the background right now. Uh, no aliens though, but um, it was really good. Uh, again, a combination of those that you could and cannot go back to. I know, I remember you could not go back and redo Operation Anchorage. I don't remember the rest of them. I think Mothership Zeta. You can go up to the cockpit every once in a while, but that was it. Uh, Lookout. I think you can go back and forth. Uh, Broken Steel, I think, like I said, was just the expansion. The Pit, I don't remember if you can go back and forth or not. That one, I don't remember. But going off of, uh, from that one, we're going to go to the next one was Fallout 4. Or actually, I'm going to do that later because there was something with Fallout 4 I wanted to talk about. Um, so next instead, we're going to go to uh, New Vegas. Um, so with New Vegas, of course, that was one of the one that was not actually made by Bethesda. It was made by... Um, don't, I, I can't... I can't remember. I, I forgot who made this one. Um, Obsidian. There we go. Sorry, I know I should remember Obsidian because New Vegas is one of the best fallouts or, or have been. And Obsidian did a great job with it. And I think they only had a year for it. But um, Fallout New Vegas, one of my one of my favorite of all the Bethesda titles here. And I think a lot of people will agree with that. 
Um, but they had four major DLCs. Now, there's something else with some of the Bethesda DLCs. They typically do either, you know, the big, you know, story DLCs, you know, you know, 20 plus hours, whatever, for their story, or they do like smaller things where they release like weapon packs or that kind of thing. And they did do that on this one. They had four big DLCs and then two smaller ones. They had the courier stash and they had the, uh, the gun runners, uh, arsenal. And all it basically did was add in some extra weapons and armor and crap. So, I mean, it's not something you would notice in a later run through, really, if there was in there, like you'll, like, when, when you get it the first time at school, but, I mean, once you play up to watch, it's just something that you just feel should be in the game automatically. So, again, not full-on DLCs, but um, still add-ons that were that were added in after the base game. And, again, yes, I'm still kind of hiccuping as I talk. I'm still getting used to opening my mouth as much, so forgive me. I'm also getting used to enunciating again, too. So, if I need to talk slower or something, let me know in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe, too. That's one I know I gotta I need to actually say more, too. Otherwise, people forget. But, um, yeah, again, if you like what I'm doing and want to see more content, please like and subscribe. But we're going to go with the uh, the four main DLCs for New Vegas here. So for this one, um, I played New Vegas a lot more recently than I had uh, Fallout 3. But I haven't played Fallout 3 for years, but New Vegas, I've actually I've got a whole uh, playthrough on my on my channel here. But, um, yeah, it was uh, this one is the one that I had the most emotions about because it pissed me off playing it because I wanted to kill the guy. But, um, I mean, it's, I'd say spoiler alert, but I mean, this game is so old. I mean, it, 13 years ago. So, I mean, I guess spoiler alert for everything here, but, um, you're basically kidnapped. You had to work with three other people to uh, kind of break into a casino. It was really cool. It pissed me off because I just hate situations where people kidnap me or especially if it is a Bethesda game, when you know you're going into a situation where you're about to get kidnapped or cocked over the head or something, or where I know in real life, I wouldn't have fallen for that trap. It just pisses me off. And then being forced to do something, it just... Mm. But regardless, it was a great DLC. Um, now, this is the one we have to bring into the Sierra Madre. Uh, it had some really cool lore in it. There was some lore from this that actually went through all the DLCs. Uh, with one particular... Or a couple characters, actually. But um, this is one of those one-shot deal DLCs. So once you leave that area, you're done. So you go there, you do everything, you can gather up as much stuff as you can, and then you leave. And one of the big things for this one is there's so much stuff to bring that you can't bring everything with you. Um, especially the gold bars at the end. You can't technically do it. There's a way where you can get everything and make your way out. You're going to be slow walking the whole time, but you can't technically get everything out of there. Um, it is not easy, though. Uh, I think the last playthrough I did, I was able to get every gold bar out of there. Uh, it is, it's not an easy thing to do, but it was, uh, it's worth it. Now, um, Honest Hearts was uh, another one. This is one where you go, again, to a whole other area. I think you're part of a caravan. This is one I don't remember if you can go back to or not. I want to say you couldn't go back to this area when you were finished it. I'm not 100% sure. I want to say you couldn't, but you might have been able to. I know for a Lonesome Road, you can check out some of those places because there's a lot to find there. And I know for a fact, Old World Blues, you can because you can make a house there. And uh, there's just a lot of a lot of stuff you can do in there. I think Old World Blues is my favorite one, by the way, out of all the uh, DLCs for New Vegas. But um, Honest Hearts was a pretty fun one. This is probably my least favorite out of all the DLCs. Um, I mean, it had a pretty solid mission. It wasn't anything that I didn't like. I mean, it tied into the main story, too. But, um... I mean, somebody's got to come in last place, and Honest Hearts was it for me. I'd say mm, Dead Money and Lonesome Road are probably tied for... You know what? I take it back. Old World Blues and Dead Money are tied for second place for me. Um, I did like Old World Blues a lot, but the feeling of playing Lonesome Road, and i get to that in a second, uh, was like nothing else I've played before. Um, yeah, that's when we go to a whole other area, and you... You help some tribes out, and uh, you got to make some choices through it. But again, I'm not going to put any spoilers in there, but that was uh, that was another pretty decent one. Old World Blues, uh, this is one where you had to get a whole, where you got to get a lot of future tech. Again, it had some, uh, had some pretty cool backstory. It wasn't really main story related. It was more side stuff, but you got more backstory to the game itself and kind of what's happened to the world or what's happened with the world. Um, this is one you can revisit uh, as many times as you want to. You kind of get your own player house in there. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. Uh, a lot of utility with it. And again, a lot of a lot of secret stuff to find, a lot of Easter eggs, and a lot of uh, good stuff you can walk away with. Now, Lonesome Road was meant to be and was pretty much the last chapter of Fallout New Vegas. I think it was their last, yeah, September, uh, 
2011. This was their last DLC and worked perfectly as an ending for uh, New Vegas. I think the only thing that could have been better is if Ulysses could have been a follower. Um, I mean, spoiler alert, if he could have been a follower afterwards, there's a mod that lets you do that. But Lonesome Road pretty much tied in everything. It, and it told you not just about the world around you, but about your character too. Um, in fact, the story of Lonesome Road actually starts before, lore-wise, before New Vegas proper and begins. So your your story is actually tied into Lonesome Road. I liked it a lot. Doing Lonesome Road, you just go through it and it feels so lonely and it feels so final. It is, it's it's beautiful and I love doing it every time. No matter how many times I've played it, Every time I do it, uh, just my mindset goes into like emo depression. I'm like, shit, this is this is the lonesome road. It's, I mean, I know it sounds dramatic, but it, it really does. Uh, it it is definitely my favorite DLC, and I just love the feeling about it. I love these survival games, especially Fallout games, where a lot of times you're like in super bright lit areas. I really like Lonesome Road because it actually feels like Armageddon a bit more. Fallout 3 did too, a bit more New Vegas. New Vegas was a bit more, you know, well lit even for a desert. But Lonesome Road really, for all the Fallout games, felt more post-apocalyptic to me. And that's, a, even with all the people in it, it feels lonely. Even though you have a partner with you the whole time too, but it feels lonely and that I loved about it. Um, next up, we're going to go up to Fallout 4. And this is where things kind of take a little bit of a turn here. Now, as you can see, for the Fallout DLC so far, we've got four to five big main DLCs for these games. So it looks like Fallout 3 had five, New Vegas had four, plus two smaller ones. Fallout 4 kind of broke with that tradition. And that tradition also was with, uh, I think, Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim, too. i got to double check that. I don't think they had four, but, but the Fallout 4 was what they were doing for a while, and then Fallout 4 kind of screwed that one up. Now, Fallout 4, I would say their main ones were, and I got them listed here, is Automatron, uh, Wasteland Workshop, Fall Harbor, Contraptions Workshop, vault Tech Workshop, Nuka World, and a high-res texture pack. Now, the texture pack, obviously not a DLC. Anything with Workshop in it, not a DLC. And Automatron was a half DLC. The only two real DLCs that I would say, or story-wise, that I would count for Fallout 4 are going to be Far Harbor, which was amazing. And Nuka World, which I fucking hate it. Okay. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, Fallout 4 introduced base building officially for the first time without mods or anything. What they did instead of releasing like item packs like they did in Fallout, uh, Fallout um, New Vegas, they released workshop items. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they released workshop items and all they were were items you can add to your base. They did not add any story content at all. Now, some of the workshop items were cool, but they should have just been add-ons to the game for free, not something you had to pay for. And there was some controversy at the time, and honestly, it still lingers, because some of these workshop items, I mean, they should have either A, been in the base game, or B, if not, had to be paid for, be counted as DLC, but they were DLC. Uh, Automatron was a DLC, it had a story to it, and you would, able, would be able to make your own robot army afterwards, which was cool, but it was extremely short. This is more, um, Automatron was more like an introduction to a new, to a new thing you could do in the game versus an actual DLC. It was more of a tutorial for robot building than it was a DLC. You still got some good, a little bit of story out of it, and you got a base out of it, but all it really was is an introduction to robot building. Now, like I said, Far Harbor was amazing. It gave me the same feeling that uh, Lonesome Road gave me. Um... And that you're kind of alone out there. It was kind of that horror vibe. Uh, I like that one as well. But um, yeah, Far Harbor was a really good one. Nuka World is the one where I think Bethesda kind of shit the bed. Uh, as far as choice wise and as far as what we were forced to do. Nuka World was the one where you basically, if you wanted to get everything you could out of the DLC. Or even progress more than a few hours. You had to be a bad guy. And not only had to be a bad guy. You essentially had to destroy, if you wanted to get, you know, as far as you get in it, you had to destroy what you'd already done in the main game. Um, and again, this is a bit of a newer game, but I'll still give a spoiler alert. Uh, essentially, you had to become a raider. Uh, you could just kill the raiders if you wanted to and free everybody when you got there. Um, but then you'd be locked out of all the shit at the end. If you wanted to progress in it, you had to become a raider. 
not only be a raider, he had to go and raid bases or settlements in the main story, which would, of course, make people turn on you. You had to be a bad guy in the main story, which was an issue for me. So being forced to uh, be a raider was not something I enjoyed at all. Um, I think it just would destroy your game if you wanted to have a good playthrough. And uh, I mean, it, it, I just didn't like it at all. I, I didn't like that the choice had to be made to be a dick and there were to be a bad guy. And even if it'd be better if it didn't affect your main save file at all, if it didn't affect what was happening in the rest of the, the Commonwealth, but um, it did. And that's the issue. Like if it was two separate systems and the Commonwealth didn't know what you're doing as a raider, that'd be one thing, but they absolutely did. And you had to go and essentially hurt what you've done in the Commonwealth for this DLC. I absolutely hated it. Now, again, this, uh, this set of DLC, these workshop DLCs were, and really still are, uh, controversial. They were, I mean, there were, people were pissed off when they came out. Okay. We wanted, and I say we, I mean, we, there were many videos that came out about this. You can probably still go back and see some, but people wanted actual big DLCs and that's not what we got for this. And it, it broke my heart and it pissed a lot of people off because the DLCs for workshops were also base building and a lot of people didn't like to do the base building. Um, the base building was kind of clanky. It still is. It's in Fallout 76. It's slightly improved, but overall it's, it's the same shit and it was really clanky. Um, people just did not necessarily like doing it. Um, again, if you like doing it, there are some amazing mods out for it. People, some people do like doing it, but a lot of people didn't. And essentially getting three quote unquote DLCs that were only about base building brought people the wrong way. Um, that being said, we're going to go ahead and get over to the Elder Scrolls now. Um, uh, now first off, starting off with Morrowind. Now this was actually the first Bethesda game that I played. Um, let me get over to the DLCs here. Here we go, expansions. Now, these don't have, the Elder Scrolls didn't have four and five DLCs like the Fallout, uh, series did. Um, so we're going to go down to, uh, the expansions here. I only remember two, and that was Tribunal and, yeah, there was only two, uh, Tribunal and Blood Moon. Now, when I got the game, I borrowed it from a buddy, and I was playing the Game of the Year edition, which already had these two on it. So, Tribunal and Blood Moon. Blood Moon was the one where you essentially got to become a werewolf. It was really cool. Um, again, it's an old game, so I'm not going to worry too much about spoiler alerts, but, um, yeah, it was basically a werewolf DLC. And the Tribunal was more of a mystery type DLC. And if you haven't started to notice the pattern here, a lot of the DLCs that are coming out for Bethesda or for Bethesda RPGs have some kind of mystery element into it, which is the first thing I think you're going to be getting for Starfield is going to be some kind of mystery DLC. Um, it could be a murder, it could be some kind of mystery MacGuffin, whatever. It's going to have that air of mystery to it, and that's uh, one thing that I'm looking forward to. But, again, that's just speculation right now. There's nothing being confirmed yet. This is just what they've done in the past and what I think is going to happen. But, yeah, Tribunal was more of a mystery thing. You basically had to go and uh, find out why uh, why these people were being attacked, yada, yada, yada. Long story short, there were twists and turns and there were betrayals, but this was their mystery DLC for, for Morrowind. It was great. I loved it. Blood Moon, I love it. Again, it added new mechanics to the game. I loved them both. They were great. Um, again, older game. Um, further Elder Scrolls games got a lot more stuff into them. Or a lot more stuff added into them. And cue the horse armor. And here we come with Bethesda's first real, I'd say, DLC controversies. Now, this is a list of all the quote-unquote DLC that Oblivion had. And this was not necessarily just DLC, it was also downloadable content. And I remember when I got the DLC, I just got my Xbox, or I think it was a 360. It was amazing. I loved it. Um, I did not have internet at the time when I got this, so I did not know about the Horse Armor DLC until later on. Uh, eventually, I got internet. I was able to get the uh, the DLCs and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I had no idea that Horse Armor was a thing. And, yeah, Horse Armor for a dollar. I think it was like two bucks for Horse Armor. That was the first... I can't really say the first instance, but it's the first instance I was aware of, of just paying for skins. That's all the horse armor was in the game, was just a skin. Um, obviously, nowadays, you see people paying $50, $60 for skins sometimes, which is fucking insane. Especially for games that also cost that much. But this was what this is a, what a lot of people point out as one of the first instances of paid skins or bullshit like that in video games versus whole DLCs. Something you actually pay for that's useful, that gives you story. Instead, you get, you know, the change the way your horse looks. So this is often touted as a, 
touted it as one of those. Now, there were some other things in there, too. Now, there were some shop or not some shops, some homes that uh, opened up. Um, a lot of the stuff in there, I'm going to be honest, I don't remember. Uh, like the Wizard's Tower, I think I remember it being some house, a wild lair, same thing. I think there were just different houses you can get. Uh, spell tomes, I don't remember that at all. The Ori, Mezrun, or Mayrun's Razor, I don't remember any of that. Um, again, it could just because I just never got it or I just don't remember it. Like these aren't things like I, I started when I got back into Oblivion, I had started modding the games too. So a lot of this stuff just might not have been important because there were mods that did much better stuff than that. Um, now the two DLCs that are on here that are noteworthy are Knights of the Nine and the Shivering Isles. Now Knights of the Nine was a whole quest line to get honestly what was kind of a shitty looking set of armor that had some skills on it that were kind of shitty. Um, and I say shitty because if you played, I say shitty because if you played Oblivion, you can remember just how powerful you can get in the base game. Um, before I'd even beat the game, I already had a whole set of armor that made me completely invisible and could never be attacked. I mean, you're not going to beat that with much, you, you know, with a creature turning level 30 or some crap like that. I mean, a lot of the armor just was not good. Um, I didn't like it personally, but it did have a story to it, which is kind of cool. Um, Shivering Isles, however, Shivering Isles was an awesome DLC, and I still love it. And not only is it a DLC, it's a DLC that technically still has repercussions in the Elder Scrolls to this day. Let me take a sip and explain here. Also, again, older game, I'm going to say it now. Huge spoiler warning if you've never played Shivering Isles. You should have by now, but it is what it is. Shivering Isles basically open up a whole new world. Um, if you ever played the Elder Scrolls, you know the name Shear Gorath, or at least you know who the Daedric Princes are. Um, the best way to put it, you that, that they're basically gods. They're not, but it's the best way to put it, um, or easier way to explain it. And essentially, this god's realm was being attacked by another god. Long story short, I'm not going to go into the spoilers of it, but you go through the realms, you get to kind of learn all about this god's history, or Shear Gorath's history. At the end of it, you get to become Shear Gorath. Okay. This is canonized, I believe, and Shea Gorath is in later Elder Scrolls games, which means, and sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. The Shea Gorath in Oblivion turns out he used to be a different Daedric prince. So at the end of it, he becomes that prince again, and you take over Shea Gorath. Shea Gorath is in later Elder Scrolls games. So people widely believe that that is the character from Oblivion. That is our character from Oblivion, who is now Shea Gorath, which in the Elder Scrolls, um, Elder Scrolls games would work in that universe. So technically speaking, yes, this DLC has affected Skyrim and will affect everything beyond it. But, um, yeah, Oblivion's DLC, honestly, is probably the weakest lineup as far as DLC. Sorry, I keep hitting my microphone. Um, but Oblivion had, like, the weakest set of DLCs, in my opinion, because a lot of it was just, it was like they were experimenting, and I think at this point we can all agree they were, they are experimenting with what they can get away with as far as nitpicking and having us pay for additional content. Um, I'm not even going to get into the creation, the creation Club later on. I mean, what's currently is the Creation Club now, because I think we we all know what that is. It's basically paid mods, but this seemed like it was their first foray into trying to pull a uh, paid mod BS, but it is what it is. Um, but like I said, Oblivion was cool. Shivering Isles was the only real DLC I count on there. I don't... I think when I went back and played Oblivion later on, I didn't even do Knights of the Nine. And that's pretty bad because usually when I'm doing another playthrough of an Elder Scrolls game, the DLCs are one of the things I want to rush to and get to quickly because they're so fun and I like doing them. Um, and because I usually unlock cool stuff you can use. I, I don't think... I think I played through Knights of the Nine one time and that was it. But... Uh, we're going to go ahead and go past that and get up to our last one here. This is uh, Skyrim. Now, Skyrim is a game that's been memed on and has become a meme. It is on every system. I think it's on an Apple smartwatch at this point. It, it's basically been everywhere. It's been around forever. We're, we're, we're done with it. We want the next one. And again, Starfield's coming out now, but Skyrim has become probably, I think it's the most one of the most mighty games in history. Um, easily. And, um, I mean, it, it just needs to die. I mean, I love Skyrim when it came out, but it has got to die. Um, they kept putting it out on, or keep putting it out on different systems and people keep buying it. So 
At Pause Bethesda, I do the same thing, but I mean, this came out, what, here we go, uh, February 26th, 27th, 2013, it's been out for 10 years. Oh wait, no, here we go, it's been on that, 12 years. Came out on PlayStation 3 in 2013, came out on Xbox, uh, 2012, uh, oh wait, no, it's Don Guard, sorry, that's Don Guard. Now, here we go, it was released February 7th, uh, 2012. Was that the texture pack? Oh, well, never mind, okay, that's the texture pack. Anyway, when was, let me double check when Skyrim was released, let's see here. Oh, damn, even longer. Okay, so Skyrim itself, the original was released November 11th of 2011. So, 12 years Skyrim has been going. We're done. Um, but they had three DLCs here. Now, again, I say DLCs, technically speaking, there's only two DLCs on here, okay? And this is not counting any Creation Club stuff that came out later on. I'm talking just uh, pure Bethesda DLC. The two main DLCs were Dawn Guard, the Vampire Hunting DLC, and Oblivion, the Dragonborn DLC, basically. Did I say Oblivion? I'm sorry. Dragonborn DLC. It was called Dragonborn? Was it? Yeah, a Dragonborn Ada. Um, I could have sworn it was called something else here for a while. Um, now, the one that was not really a DLC was Hearthfire. This was a housing mod, basically. Um, this is the one that allowed you to build your own house. It, uh, it was all right. There was already mods that could do this. You could already buy your own house in game. It's cool that you could go ahead and build your own house. It, it was not as good as it could be as far as building features. Um, you're kind of locked into some stuff. You kind of had pre-built houses you just kind of eventually added on to. There were a lot of mods that did a lot better, but Hearthfire was that one just kind of like Fallout 4. It was one that I really wouldn't have counted as a DLC. It should have just been added into the base game. Now that being said, Dawn Guard unlocked the Vampire Hunters. The Dawn Guard or you become a vampire. This was a really cool one. You could become a vampire in Elder Scrolls already, but this unlocked like the pure vampire bloodline. You could actually turn into, you know, a winged vampire, crazy creature of the night. It was really cool. Or you become a vampire hunter. Uh, I'll be honest, I think I've been a vampire all but one playthrough, so <laughs> that's really hard. It is what it is. Um, I love doing it. Um, so that was a really good one. It had a really good story. It had a really long dungeon. It had one dungeon that's just so fucking long. I hate doing it. It took me hours to get through it, but it had really good story content, really good lore to it. I love doing it. It's one of the first DLCs I play. Uh, I think I always play that one before I do Dragonborn. I always get my vampire powers first, but, uh, it was a really good one. I highly recommend it, but that was a great DLC. Dragonborn was the other good one. Again, this one tied in directly to the story. It tied into who you are. It tied into the history of Skyrim and then Dragonborn. It was a great one. You got, again, it was... What I always like for DLCs is adding in more powers, more systems to unlock, and this did exactly that. You got more systems. Um, dragon riding sucked. Uh, when you finally got to ride a dragon, that sucked how they did that. They seriously dropped the ball on that. But the rest of it was cool. Um, but yeah, the dragon riding thing I was looking forward to the most was a terrible letdown. That was a kick in the nuts uh, at the end of the Skyrim journey. So, regardless, that was all the DLCs for the Elder Scrolls and for the you know, Fallout games. At least since Fallout 3 um, and more went. So that's as far back as I went. Uh, I haven't played any older games than that. But I want you to note that in all these games... Let me kind of go back here and just kind of point them out to it or point them out to you too. So for the whole mystery thing I mentioned before, there's a pattern of having some kind of mystery DLC in Bethesda games. So Dragonborn had a mystery to it. You kind of have to figure out who this guy is or why this guy keeps, who's, or why these people's uh, minds are taking over. Um, go back to Oblivion. You've got a shivering owls. You got to figure out what's going on with Shigarath. What's his mystery? Why is he being attacked? Why is he suddenly going insane for him? Shagora at the Tsar is insane. Him acting sane is insane. Um, go back to Morrowind here. Um, the Tribunal had that mystery aspect to it. Who is attacking us? Why are they attacking us? What is going on? What's the mystery behind all this stuff going on? Uh, here we go back to the uh, Fallout games. Now, Far Harbor, not as mystery as it could be, but it has some... If you played through right, you did find out a lot. If you didn't, and you missed a lot of mysteries. So if you actually played through everything and kind of did everything you could, or did everything that you could do in it, there was, yeah, there were some insane mysteries and secrets going on in there. Another one I liked, um, Automatron had a little bit of mystery in it. That was great, cool, but again, I can't think one as like a half DLC. It was more like uh, just a side quest we got. But I would say that the Far Harbor DLC for that one was a big mystery DLC that we got.
uh, mystery for <laughs> for for the uh, Fallout New Vegas. Uh, I'm going to say Lonesome Road itself. It was a huge mystery. Um, Old World Blues a bit, yeah. Honest Hearts, yeah. Pretty much everyone on here, damn near, except for Dead Money. I'd say Honest Hearts, Old World Blues, and Lonesome Road were all very mystery-based. Uh, Dead Money, well, no, yeah, even Dead Money. I'm sorry. Not Honest Hearts. Old World Blues, Dead Money, and Lonesome Road. They all had that mystery base to it. Uh, Honest Hearts, not really. It was more straightforward. Um... Kind of like a really easy start to finish what you were doing. There wasn't too much mystery. I mean, there was lore in it, but not really any mystery to get out of it. Uh, Old War Blues definitely did. Um, dead Money definitely did. Lonesome Road, huge mysteries and a lot of stuff uncovered there. So that was a good one. And finally, Fallout 3. Mothership Zeta, I wouldn't say it was really mystery. I mean, it's an alien spaceship. It's more of a, it's going to be a bit of a campy DLC. Um, it still has some pretty serious points in it, but um, it, it was cool. Point Lookout, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that one was... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Point Lookout. That was... Uh, this was a mystery one. This was more of a... Like I said, the mystery horror one is what I would call that one. So it definitely had some mystery to it. Uh, Pit, not so much. Operation Angry, the rest of them, not so much. But looks like all of these games have had some kind of mystery DLC. And that's where I want to talk about or what I'm getting to as far as DLC for Starfield. I think we're going to have some kind of mystery at some point. Now, as far as how that's going to play out... Um, it's pretty obvious how they're going to add it in. Um, I mean, they've got like a thousand plus planets in there. It's a game setting place in a galaxy. It's, I can almost guarantee it's going to be us getting a mysterious radio signal someday. And then us going to some uncharted planet. Or someone giving us some mysterious coordinates. And we're going to go to a planet that hasn't been charted out before. And that's how we're going to be doing their DLCs. It's, it's going to be them adding in additional planets. So how to go deal with my daughter. So it sounds pretty obvious because that's how we would deal with it. I mean, a game that relies on space travel, you know, you're going to have planets for your DLC areas. But um, it's it, there's other possibilities that could pop up, too. I mean, it could be something to where we do something in a different dimension. It could be something to where we're exploring a derelict spaceship. So all things to keep in mind, but not also where the DLC is going to take place, but what it's going to be, too. But those games tend to also not just give us story content. They unlock new systems for us. Uh, and again, like I said before, not just uh, new items like weapons and armor, but whole new systems like being able to turn into a werewolf or vampire or being able to build something new. Um, whole new mechanics added to the game. Um, that's what you typically want to see in a DLC, and that's what you typically get with Bethesda games, at least in one of the DLCs. Now, we usually have at least one or two story-based ones. Um... Like for the uh, Elder Scrolls, there are typically a couple story-based ones. But for Fallout, I mean, we typically have been getting some mechanically inclined ones, like the Atomatron uh, DLC I pointed out earlier. So hopefully Starfield follows that pattern. Hopefully they follow the pattern of more DLC, like Fallout gets, and more actual DLC, not uh, not just a couple dollar paid content. We got enough of that with Creation Club. So hopefully with Creation Club, we see less of that. Um, we'll see. Because Creation Club kind of came out midway through Fallout 4's history, so hopefully we won't be getting a $2 horse arm anymore. I'm sure we're going to get plenty of crap pushed to us through Creation Club, but I'm hoping that that frees Bethesda up for more uh, story-driven stuff, for more in-game mechanic stuff. Um, so that being said, that's all I've got as far as the speculation for the DLC. But I will also say, like I said, we're very close to time of the release for Starfield. There's going to be a lot of people giving a lot of opinions on the game a lot of people giving out a lot of bad information about the game and a lot of people giving out leaks for the game so just be careful of leaks coming up and be careful of if you're seeing anything that sounds too good to be true like i said this article i mean saying that the dlc is already in trouble if you see anything like that already make sure you're actually reading it too and realize that it's bullshit and then ignore them afterwards because that tells you all they're trying to do is get clicks i mean we can speculate all we want to without bullshitting or without lying i mean i just spent you know 40 minutes telling you guys what i think the dlc is going to take place or how it's going to work and they're flat out lying saying well the dlc is already in trouble because the game's going to be so big stuff like that i get you want to get clicks and views but that's all that is at this point is clickbait and personally i don't like it so that is my daughter so that's going to do it for me for now guys make sure you like and subscribe for more content um again we're going to be playing starfield on the first uh crotus end it's going to be coming out at the end of the week as well for Destiny 2. I don't know that I'm going to get to play that right away. This will be the first raid I don't get to play on day one. Or even that first weekend just because Starfield 
one is more important content wise but two i just want to play it more on new destiny 2 right now um destiny 2 is kind of in a weird spot right now for me i've already kind of made my rant video about that about how they really gotta knock it out of the park with the final shape where they're gonna lose pretty much their entire dedicated player base because we're not going to want to stick around for another 10 year story when the first one kind of screwed us over but that's just my opinion um like i said that's gonna do it for me for today guys thanks for coming by hit that like button and please please subscribe and uh i will see you guys later